This show is brought to you by Slice on Broadway. Supporting Pittsburgh podcasting with the perfect pepperoni pizza, SliceOnBroadway.com. And listeners like you, support this show at Patreon.com slash AwesomeCast. Sidekick Media Services. We are your sidekick in business for social media, video production, and more. Find out more at SidekickMediaServices.com. Hey guys, it's the most gadgety podcast in all of podcastingdom. It is the awesome cast. I'm Mike Sorg at Sorgatron on the Twitter here we're live from the Mayhem Studios here in Pittsburgh, PA. Ready to get awesome with you guys. I'm a video producer here in the Berg. I like to do podcasts for myself, for clients, all kinds of fun stuff. Uh, with us back in the studio from his hiatus from Island Chill, it is Chilla. Island Chill. I like that. I mean, borrow that, that sounds like the name of a frozen margarita maker. Yes, I have chill is Island Chill. <laughs> Island he, chill. of course, is the gadget guru at Big Bank Bonanza International, which I, I understand. He was, I learned. So here's what I learned. We'll talk about this uh, more in in future episodes as I, I I'm gathering information. But I'm driving for Uber, and I keep getting okay. PNC Bank employees. And then uh, uh, I I was like, oh yeah, I got a guy on a podcast. Da 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 da. And he's like, and I gave the name, knew you, knew Kraus, and uh, I didn't know you were a big shot executive. Not really. <laughs> no. Somebody thinks you're a big <laughs> shot executive out there, and I hope he's listening My right name's now. on a lot of stuff. <laughs> oh, yeah? <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I thought that was interesting. He was a data guy, I think. So, uh, yeah, getting to know. I, I, it's, 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 you're, I don't know who's... There's more, someone, someone at work was saying they were doing, they were doing cost analysis for themselves, and, and I think they lived in the Green Tree area. I picked somebody up from Green Tree, And they yeah. were saying that it's, that it's getting close to the point where Uber is soon to be cheaper than taking Port Authority. Really? Yes. It's not, no, it's not. Mm-mm. Or I'm sorry, no, I'm Mm-mm. sorry, maybe not, ta- not taking Port Authority, parking in town. Oh, yes. That I could believe. That I could Yeah, absolutely. Wow, that, that. wow. So there's a lot of there's a lot of people that are saying, you know, I may just start taking Uber every day. Mm-hmm. That's that's incredible. That's incredible. But we'll talk about that in my interesting side uh, job some other time. But uh, I should really get around to introducing AJ. AJ cut the virtual potholes dot com is the blog. It is that the is blog it. where he blogs things of an enterprising nature. Yes, uh, I actually did that cost analysis. In case anybody, Shelley, you're wondering, uh, I did do the cost analysis, and it turns out so about it's eleven dollars and fifty nine cents because I almost Ubered home tonight. Uh, it's eleven dollars and fifty nine cents uh, one way to go from downtown to my house, um, and I think if you take into consideration car insurance, car parking, and driving into town every day plus gas. It's a wash now with Uber for me, and I could do it. And uh, then I remember that I have a uh, I have a hundred dollar bus pass and nothing. No Uber ain't cutting that. But mm-mm, mm-mm, mm-mm. no Uber. I will take the bus all day long. It's way cheaper. It's and, interesting. Uh, they've made it a lot easier. And uh, January first, everything everything's going to be weird. So if you're listening to it's my voice and you live in the city of Pittsburgh and you take the bus to work every day, it's going to get real weird on January first. Mm. They're changing the entire way that you get on and get off of the bus and mm. all kinds of other fun stuff. So, yeah, January 1st is going to get weird and awkward. I'm, sh- I'm sure it's going to be just as well of a rollout as chip cards have been in America. Uh, well, about that, about cards, uh, they have the, the tap cards now. Uh, so you don't even mm. they're actually changing to a system where you pay more if you're paying cash. If you're paying with the card, you pay less. So it's like easy pass. So, so and that's how it's been for train riders for a long time is not during rush hour you pay more when yeah. you pay cash yeah. versus if yeah. you pay with the card yeah so yeah and that's i think they're changing they're also changing the way the the t runs they're not going to do that anyways welcome to local transit talk <laughs> all right moving <laughs> on this is the awesome cast please check out everything at awesomecast.net subscribe to us on stitcher speaker iheart radio facebook and youtube are the video versions of the show also please hey if you guys are uh, uh on the itunes and the speaker for uh, awesome cast or awesome chat we are having some issues uh we are moving to a we we got the the beta invite so you guys are our beta 
uh, testers of sorts. Uh, we're on fireside.fm uh, from the great uh, Dan Benjamin of 5 by 5 Networks. You may know him from Back to Work, Quit, and a whole bunch of other great stuff they have going on over there. Uh, so, yeah, we're trying that out for Awesome Cast, Awesome Chat, and the Sugartron Media uh, Master Feed. And we do know that bringing everything over from TalkShoe, we had a pretty severe timeout. And so um, I have placeholders for everything, but not every episode made it on. Um, so, I mean, I, we shouldn't have any issues um, from here forward on new episodes. But if you're looking for like past um, um, shows, everything's still on TalkShoe and old fields and old links over on awesomecast.net it just um uh, so let us know if there's anything else that gets weird with your feed and we're going to be updating very shortly the tune in and any other feeds that i can remember that we connected with um actually i don't think we were on tune in technically we're on tune in via river's edge but i don't think we were ever able to get on tune in because of our previous host so so look for us on tune in very soon hopefully uh so we're going to email those guys and get that stuff lined up so uh, please let us know if there's any issues with that. Awesomecast on Twitter or Facebook or uh, awesomecast at uh, sorgatronmedia.com, of course. So uh, also, please, speaking of River's Edge, we are on there, of course, on their feeds over there and over on uh, riversedgepgh.com, the, the, their streaming feed, 24-hour music and talk, Thursday mornings, 8 a.m. after Funny Money. And of course, we're right here every Tuesday live.awesomecast.net at 7 p.m. Eastern time. Yeah, I might have changed things up. Um, our chat room has sucked the last few weeks, so we're just giving you a link to our Facebook. I still still try to go to live.awesomecast.net in case we change things, because we're going to... Uh, I, I want a chat client there that's not Facebook. Right now, Facebook seems like the best thing. I'm hoping maybe we can bring the chat over from Facebook for our own page. I just like the having a place where we live that's not somebody else's thing right even though we're using them as a platform because obviously we moved from youtube to facebook in recent weeks and uh and that's why it's nice to just have a spot to do it so live.awesomecast.net is the place whatever we have going on it will be linked there uh for the main show here sometimes i don't get to it when we do uh spot interviews like we did earlier with the great mike quack and bush of jakara check that out on awesome chat later this week we're going to talk indiegogo and the jakara video game please go support it all right guys it is time oh wait wait quick i almost forgot patreon supporters big shout out to michael fedor uh mike fedor show on twitter for supporting the show you can too patreon.com slash awesome cast guys it's time for the awesome thing of the week and uh chilla i think you have the not apple or okay here's a warning so so usually when there's an event we get AJ on here, and we're talking Apple the entire yep. time, right? Mm, yeah, yeah. I really want to see what this is going to go because we had an Apple and we had a Microsoft event that I think were both interesting in their own ways. So I think there's going to be a lot of comparison points today. But first, awesome thing of the week, Chilla. Let's talk about Google. So, so I got the <laughs> Google Tango phone that launched today. Um, it's it's coming out from Lenovo. Lenovo bought the Motorola portion of Google. Um, and they came out with the Fab 2 Pro. I'm not too happy with the name. Fab 2. It's P-H-A-B. It's, it's Fab, bro. It's fab. It's so but, Fab. But it, it, Wait, I'm sorry. Is this a Fablet? No. It, well, no, because it is a It's got to be a Fablet. If you're going to name it Fab with a P-H, this isn't 1997. <laughs> it's considered a phone, but it does have a 6.4-inch screen. Fablet. Ooh. Carry on. Clocking in at $499. Not too bad for that size of a phone with no. this much power. Um, because this does run all of the Tango technology. So it can do all the indoor 3D mapping, which makes it perfect for an augmented reality device. And, and um, Tango is the augmented reality technology that we've been hearing like kind of rumors about for the longest time. Yeah, and we, we saw when they started doing some of the indoor mapping, they had kind of their 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 beta or alpha device that had the, the two cameras on it. Um, launching with the 35 apps, I thought was pretty cool because they, they definitely targeted it at, at younger generations and with a few tools that they're already talking about for for the for the older people out there. Um, Crayola Color Blaster, which is a zombie color blasting game. Um, they also have a, have a game called Slingshot Island that I thought was pretty, it sounds pretty cool. Um, it pretty much puts objects around your, your room, like an egg could be sitting on a shelf, and you have to use the phone as a slingshot to shoot projectiles at it. Um, 
I think, like I said, I, I think the concept's really, really cool, and I like it much better than having to deal with goggles. Um, and obviously, as you see kids there in, in the video moving around a room and shooting at zombies, um, they wouldn't be able to run like that with, with goggles on their head or even the, the Daydream VR that's coming out because their vision would be completely but blocked. As I see these kids running around, I feel like uh, this is going to lead to a lot of cracked screens, too. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. Uh, Motorola's yeah, but... last phone had, had like an 18-foot drop test that, yeah. it, that it, was, it, it passed pretty pretty well. It's a big piece of glass. Like seeing the kids like 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 carry that around, like it re- it reminds me. I know it's not too far off from the the Nexus Seven in size, you know. And we know how. I mean, AJ. Uh, I mean, kids. I, I mean, you know. Yes, r- uh, right. Said said Nexus Seven uh, took a took a tumble, mm-hmm. and I had to replace the screen on it, and that was not fun at all. So and let me tell you, slivers of glass hurt real bad in your fingers oh but i do it for the kids uh i got like a replacement screen from amazon for like 40 bucks and uh i replaced the screen and that was it's it's easy enough to do but once it's cracked it's over um so it's not really easy to do they basically they were like heat it up with a blow dryer and i didn't have a blow dryer so i'm like sitting there like trying to use like a space heater to do it it did not work out very well um (laughs) But I got it all. I got the screen replaced and everything, everything was fine. But yes, children will drop this thing. And when they do, you will be sad because your very fancy uh, indoor mapping thing. Is indoor mapping a thing? Did we all ask for this? I don't recall. Um, so, so the one I, thing I thought was interesting, like, and, and I'm redoing my basement right now, and it, they talked about you know you could take furniture and place it around a room to see what it would look like. Um it can do measurements of walls, a, a lot of the depth pieces. That's where I definitely found it interesting from a, hey, I want to redo a space in my house, but I don't want to have to actually physically move around furniture constantly. So that, I thought that was an I, interesting concept as well. I have I have the problem there because um, that is something that um, my significant other enjoys doing a great deal, <laughs> which is, hey, you know, I want to move everything in this room around. And then we go do that. And then we have a new room all of a sudden. And then I'm sweaty. So... <laughs> Uh, and I love her for it because then sometimes the the idea works out really well, and I have uh, like a my couch is now over there. Okay, great. And now I now I have a better viewing angle on my television. So not oh, mad. Um, yeah, I don't know the indoor mapping thing. Like I feel I, I have I have distinct qualms with VR and, and augmented reality. I feel like it's it, it feels like a I don't know. I don't like it. I think it's silly. I think that there's like a there's a thing where it's like you're gonna strap the whole goggle system on like the VR situation. Uh, I don't know how I feel about that one. Just feels silly to me. It's like I'm gonna sit on the couch or I'm gonna stand up and fall over because uh, it gets it got too real. Um, but having the just the gigantic goggles uh, doesn't make any sense to me. The augmented reality thing seems kind of cool, but I would like to see it in a uh, a form factor that doesn't look completely insane like Hololens. Um, this seems okay, but I'm still holding a tablet in front of my face. Um, mm. but so you, but I, you, I actually still kind of liked the Google Glass, to be entirely honest. Like from a as, from an overall concept, you don't you don't have to go get it, Sorg. It's fine. Uh, <laughs> no, no, no. I, now I'm trying. I can't see if if it ever pans to me to speak. Uh, our our in screen no. TV went. Our, our monitor. There we went. go. There we go. Hold and, on. If I hold this right here. Technical difference. It'll work. Don't, nobody, don't. nobody else sees this. This is all just you and me. Some duct tape. Do I have some duct tape? Technical it's not duct tape technical because it's, it's just like the co- the cord needs to sit right. We need new stuff. We, we, donate to the Patreon so Sora can get a new in, in in studio TV so the guests don't ask questions in the middle. It's the, <laughs> the, it's the box. The it's the cord. It's no, 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 nothing to see here. Nothing to see here, guys. Go to patreon.com slash Chilling? Did you have and, something to uh, say? Nah. <laughs> so. Oh, when again? Become a Patreon. Yeah. Uh, so they have a yeah. The, the the whole AR thing seems neat in theory, but like in practice, I don't understand the practical application of it, other than like games, maybe. Like somebody was talking to me uh, at work about like putting on the Hololens and like you could do your work via that. And I'm sorry, that's silly. When even the Hololens like, only has a small portion of the screen that is actually can you can actually watch augmented reality through so i i'm not seeing that where, where i see if you were doing home renovation as a, as a company you could you could take this device with you and say hey this is what this is going to look like hey 
Yeah, can go I, I, I can see that. Uh, I do feel like that's kind of a um, it's a niche market, uh, and I feel like they already have that. But yeah, I, th- I could see that uh, improved technology. That's like, hey, we really know what's going on because we have two cameras and we can do three D modeling of the room. Yeah, sure. Sorry, I didn't mean to put down your awesome thing of the week. I'm sorry. That's okay. Man. I'm used to it. Awesome fighting of the week. Uh, AJ, what is your awesome thing of the week? My awesome thing of the week is. Uh, I really like the concept of it. I don't know how it really works and pra- how it works, how it's going to work as well in practice, but uh, the touch ID sensor on the new MacBook pros. Mm. Um, and, and the reason I say, and the touch bar as well. So the touch bar, touch ID on the new, uh, on the new MacBook pros. Uh, one of the cool things I saw about the, the, the touch ID sensor is that it actually has an arm chip in it. It actually runs a modified version of watch OS and it's a completely separate unit inside the device so it doesn't have anything to do with the intel chips or the motherboards or anything it's a completely separate device that interacts somehow with the the actual machine i thought that was super cool and super clever um and now apple look at me look me dead in the eyes here apple where's my external keyboard with the touch bar on it the time is yours now apple let's do this come they on did, they did show a mock out of my pocket and into your bank account let's do this they, they did show a mock-up uh, on nine to five mac yeah oh yeah i mean that you can mock it up pretty easily take the take the existing keyboard and just copy paste over the top <laughs> it's not it's not really difficult to do a uh um it's not hard to do the, the the mock-up there but it's that whole concept of having touch interface without doing a touch screen and i'm with i'm with john gruber on this one apple's never doing a touch screen macbook not never it doesn't fit their ui it doesn't fit what they do it doesn't fit mac os like there'd be a there'd have to be a lot of changes that go into both the os and the hardware and the ergonomics of that and if you're looking for the ergonomics of a touchscreen desktop, I would point you to the Verge's pictures of the Surface Studio where it had Panos Panay, who is a very wonderful presenter, bent over the table <laughs> trying to like draw something on the screen. It looks silly, right? It doesn't look ergonomic. It looks like a thing. Now, uh, Microholic from I, – I really hope I'm pronouncing that right uh, – from Penny Arcade got an early demo unit and had it in the house and he was drawing and stuff and he loves it. So I know there are people who are going to like this. I don't know how many people those are. Well, I think it's very, um, very, as far, okay. So let's, let's shift to a little bit of the talk about the, sur- the surface. We'll come back around on the touch bar. Cause I, uh, or should I talk actually, can we step aside and touch, t- talk touch bar for a moment? Yeah. Go ahead. Talk about it. Sir. Cause I feel like, I, I feel like we're going to go off the rails on this one. Um, so on the touch bar, um, I am, very interested in how they're going to be using it for Final Cut. So I did get the update for Final Cut, and of course I don't have the awesome new MacBook to really kind of look into it. Uh, that's you know, that's like, why you need that sweet, sweet external yeah, that keyboard. sweet, sweet external keyboard, right? To throw on my uh, 2011 Mac Mini so I can get all the nice new features, you know. Uh, but unfortunately, I have to get a, uh, a $2,400 starting MacBook, uh, but which I will pay, by the way. I will absolutely pay. This is my next MacBook, absolutely. But uh, I, as soon as they said, um, oh, hey, there's your entire timeline on on the keyboard that is that that had me and then then now that it's going to be context sensitive um buttons that go with that uh i that's me seeing okay that is a functional use that is something that will change my workflow i think like looking at that that touch bar really kind of shows like like some functionality to it that 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 you wouldn't have if you were just doing a touch screen right if i was doing a touch screen final cut it would, you know, it's not made for that. Like, it'd be interesting to kind of like slide around, but like my finger is going to hit the wrong part and like move a clip or something, right? And, um, and it's, it's probably not going to be context aware. They, they talked about a lot of, I, I think the person from Adobe was talking about, you know, things that the thing that the things that they were bringing to the touch bar right. were menus and menus deep inside of the application. Right. If it was a touch screen, you're still going to be tapping and holding to act, act like a right click, or you're still going to be going up to your menus. I just I, I think the touch bar definitely brings new light and new life into applications and also will surface yeah. capabilities that, that people just didn't even know that were there. 
Yeah, a little bit of like, oh, I can do what now when I select this thing? Mm -hmm. um, and, and again, that will, you know, I've been using Final Cut for years. And there's stuff in the menus. I, I don't think it's probably as um, crazy as, like, say, a, a Photoshop gets with stuff. But there's definitely stuff in there and tools that in Final Cut that I don't use on a regular basis. Either maybe my project never projects never call for it, or I just don't know it's in there. And with any professional application like that, that that's that's the way it is, mm -hmm. you know. But if there's something like that that, that that surfaces stuff, yeah, I think it only helps in situations like that. So, but then you become dedicated to, okay, I like using Final Cut on my with my trackpad on my on my MacBook, right? I hate having to sit down at a mouse and keyboard and use the same program because it's a different experience. Mm -hmm. It's a different flow. I can't do things as fast. So now you have that, and yeah, I can get a touchpad, and now this is where, AJ, we need your keyboard. We I sure do. Yep. So, um, but no, I, I think that's, that's definitely worthwhile. All right, let's talk about um, the Surface Studio Pro in a moment, but first I want to talk about the pizza. The pizza is the pizza. awesome. The pizza is awesome. Our good friends, Slice on Broadway, sliceonbroadway.com, the newly redesigned, I need to point out, SliceOnBroadway.com. They have and they have a VIP club that you can sign up for for some goodies and some uh, uh, price, some some discount and uh, and uh, free pizzas. I think along the way too. Um, the, you uh, you check out the, the they actually have online ordering. This is the only thing is online ordering. As much as I love calling everybody because they're really awesome down there. Sometimes you don't want to pick up a phone. Sometimes you just want to go to a Grubhub. But they got it coming up soon. Um, they've been doing a lot of really cool stuff. Just finished their uh, first season at PNC Park, home of the Pittsburgh Pirates. And uh, it looked like it was very successful. I know a lot of new people got to check out Slice on Broadway because of that location down there. So please go check them out. They're down there, uh, PNC Park, like I said, here in the hood in Beachview, right along the tracks here on Broadway. Hence the name, and down in Carnegie, PA on Main Street. Uh, they've the, been supplying us with the perfect pepperoni pizza to support Pittsburgh Podcasting for so long. PGH underscore Slice on the Twitter and Slice on Broadway on the Facebook and Instagram. Let them know the awesome cast sent you. And you also, nailed the alliteration there. I like that. <laughs> I don't get it every week. I don't get it every week. That's a lot no, of No, you nailed it, though, this week. This Thank is you. a good one. Thank you. Uh, you, should, you should be proud of this one. By the way, uh, PNC Park, directly across the river from my office, and I still have not gone to Slice because I'm a horrible human. Mm. Horrible, mm. you hear me? I'm terrible. What so, is wrong um, with you? Yeah, so we got we got to do. I got to go do that. By the way, uh, shout out to Beachview getting Big Shot Bob's, the best wing place in Pittsburgh. Yes. you should go there. I'm giving them pure. This is pure me. This, they're not paying me to say this. I had their wings last night. I paid money for them, and they are awesome. So you should go get them. Uh, get the uh, Mister Northside and get the uh, the Steel City wings, and they're amazing. I was very close to ordering them last night, to be honest. Uh, but uh, uh, get the Steel City, their buffalo sauce with uh, with ranch seasoning. Okay, and it will change oh. your life. Where's it located at? Uh, right, the, the former Feeney's Weenies. Okay, up okay. around the bend. So there you go. So welcome to this week in Beachview food. Um, <laughs> hmm. Uh, I'm also, hey, big shout out to our friends Ohio Linux Fest because I found a box of these things on my stoop. And for you on audio, that is an awesome cast mug I'm holding up here. Yeah, we got a we got a nice bat batch of them. Um, also, thanks to uh, uh, CodeForSale.com, I think are also uh, uh, who hooked this up. The, the product and marketing team um, over at Ohio Linux Fest uh, hooked them up uh, for us. So thank you. We really do you appreciate guys. that. You need to have like an actual like you need to set up a desk setup now and have Chilla on as your guest, like an Ed McMahon, so everybody <laughs> drinks out of the same mugs. Well, we also, I mean, we got at this point, at well, this point, that's what we have to do. Now you got mugs, you have to do it. Well, I, well, I got to complete the set because we also have fishing without bait mugs from Spreadshirt. So, so maybe, yeah, maybe we we need to put our own mugs up there. On it, it, let us know on on Twitter in the chat room on the Facebook chat or where, wherever you might be. Uh, let us know if you want awesome cast mugs. Uh, do we'll, you want merch? Do you want merch? Do you want more awesome cast merch? Are we not merching out enough for you? Because I don't know. I put some stuff out out there every once in a while, and 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 I never really get much response on it. Uh, so so just want to make sure. Like, what what do you guys want? What do you want to see? Do you want chill uh, uh, wheels? Do you want an awesome cast scarf? I don't know. I don't know what you need. Do you need a stocking hat? I want branded like Chuck. Do you want to think about gadgets while your neck is cold? Get an awesome cast scar. <laughs> there you go. There you go. All right. Let's talk about awkward positions. Um, Microsoft Surface Studio out 
Appling Apple. Holy hell. Uh, this was... So, the sur- I'm not going to lie. The Surface is a sexy device. It's sexy, but using it for a prolonged period of time... Wait, are you I, telling me the Surface is not functional? It, it, it goes back to what, what AJ was saying about, about the UI. The, the UI... It's great when you're in a Microsoft application that was designed for that UI in mind. I don't feel like the U, everybody's UI isn't developed for that. And mm-hmm. I feel like I'm constantly trying to use the very tip of my finger. And I don't have the biggest fingers in the world. But I'm constantly using it to, fu- to, to hit this small, small tool. And I'm not going to pull out my stylus every five minutes to, to, to fine tap something. Let's see. I was talking about how, how, how good this stuff looks, but then you have this kind of yoga laptop thing going on over here that does not look good sitting on somebody's lap. <laughs> I'm just, uh, after using the, the surface for a while, I, I feel like I want, all I feel like I want to do is dock it mm. and, and have a mouse and keyboard and the surface from the surface perspective, not the, not the studio, but, there, I know a lot of people complain about the keyboard on the new the new MacBook, but the keyboard on the Surface, the keys are all jammed together. They're big square buttons that feel all wobbly and and loose. Just typing on it for any prolonged period of time is, is I find difficult. The, the touchpad is extremely small. Mm-hmm. I, I I feel like I just constantly want to dock it. Mm-hmm. Take it back somewhere where I have a keyboard and a mouse. So, and so it sounds like you're sitting there and you're playing. You're you're using this thing day to day tasks like work tasks, right? Mm-hmm. And which is exactly what they say. They're like, this is a thing that you can take to work, and it does more than an iPad. Like that's the company line. And you're saying, I feel like any prolonged use, I want to I want to send it at a workstation. Man, I wish this was a real computer. Right. Yeah. Like function. Like 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 style wise. Yes. I mean, if I, well, co- by the way, for, uh, I mean, the sword, there is a, uh, a link in the, uh, in the Google doc. It's of, of the surface studio. Okay. And it is a picture of Panos Panay, who is the arc or the uh, executive behind all of the surface products. And he's using the surface studio while standing. And it looks just as awkward as you think. So, so yeah, I mean, it, it's, and even the service studio, I get the use for it. And I think very, very particularly, because I thought about this when I was thinking about, because we knew AJ was going to be on this week with all the events coming up. And I'm, I'm, I'm watching this thing and I'm like, that's a great device. That's a really good idea. There's a lot of awesome stuff going in on that. But I looked at what Chilla does, what AJ does, what I do. None of us have any need for that device it's not for us it's absolutely not sorry, for us. sorry you're the closest one yeah you are I, the I, closest I, one I, I know but i'm not drawing crap on screens right um unless you're going to tell me that that's going to be a really kick-ass wirecast get set up like i could see the idea of putting wirecast on there that we use the switch and there's these like you know basically i'm switching by pushing the buttons of each shot okay now i really want one um but uh but i'm not putting the money in for something like that right uh, it's it's yeah, it's for designers. It's for high-end 3D, 2D designers, right? Uh, uh, like those creatives that can use a giant touchpad. Uh, uh, Tycho, Tycho uh, Bray, isn't it? Uh, from, uh, no, it's Mike, the, the artist. Oh, the other one. Okay. Um, I flipped them. Um, but the, the, the you know guys from Penny Arcade that do that stuff, like Surface was always a great thing for them. Surface is not a great thing for a video editor, no matter what, no. even if you are a Premier user. Right, um, like I, I use I use two twenty inch monitors at work. I have many things that I do all day long, none of which involve touch. Mm-hmm. Um, now, to be fair, Microsoft, and this is kind of where I, I find it interesting that everybody's like, "That's a thing that Apple should have done. Why didn't Apple do that?" Because Apple put all their touch assets into iOS. They did not put touch anything into Mac OS ten. So, unless this is going to be a gigantic iOS device which it's not, and it never would be. This is, this is how Microsoft kind of positioned their entire platform with Surface, with the Surface Studio now. Um, th- this is what they made Windows 8. This is what they made Windows 8.1 and Windows 10 for. They made it to be a gigantic touch environment. 
and so that they could go from something like the Surface 4 or Surface the Surface Pro to go from being a tablet, being able to do things, draw on the screen, whatever, which I could use from time to time, but not like all the time. And then be able to move from that to being a, as Chilla uses it, a desktop and do it all fairly seamlessly and be able to use the ability to have the ability to use a mouse and a keyboard in the same device. Mm -hmm. Um, I I will say this. The cool part was the surface surface dial. Dial. Is that what they're calling it? So it's a, it's a little rounded rotary uh, thing that sits on the monitor. The monitor knows that it is a, that that's what the device is and is able to open up smaller menus or do zoom things based on just placing it on the monitor. That I thought was super cool, but I don't have a use for it, right? So there's there's a lot of things that Microsoft is doing that are super duper cool. That are things like HoloLens, Surface Studio, uh, the Surface Dial. They are aiming at a very. They're trying to aim towards markets they've never really been able to get into before. And they're taking advantage of the fact that Apple is not putting out very powerful machines. Uh, Case in point, the MacBook Pros max out at 16 gigs of RAM, and I cannot tell you the heartburn that a bunch of coworkers or that a bunch of people I know in my industry had about that. Um, they wanted 32; they really wanted it badly. And uh, Apple's reasoning was battery life. Um, they couldn't get low power dims that would be able to go to 32. Plus, Apple does all their memory on board, so you can't even upgrade. And meanwhile, later. they're making the case in Apple's event, um, taking that MacBook and hooking it up to everything and making a, a, a big workstation for mm-hmm. your media work right and there was a big play in there there was a big play in in hey this is your thing for your media production right that was the what the yeah. macbook and the and the touch bar and everything was for two you're not 5k displays two 5k displays it would pump out all this stuff but then you're like yeah but i need more ram like their own program could use some more ram final cut pro right mm-hmm. and there's really and the way that their their lineup of machines stacks up, the MacBook Pro is the only thing, but they're not going to give me more RAM. Like that's so. I think what they're gonna and what you're gonna see is I, I'm expecting at least early next year. I expect to see a Mac Pro and iMac refresh. Has to be. Um, Has to be. Now I will say this: the Mac Pros are very much waiting for Intel's new server line. They skipped the Broadwell line. They are waiting for Skylake. Skylake is a big flipping deal, and I see that in my field a lot. Because by the way, the Mac Pro and what I do for a living, uh, doing cloud and enterprise sort of stuff, use the exact same CPU. So the Skylake is something I'm actually quite looking forward to. Things like hundred gig interconnects. Um, being able to do things that you couldn't really do before without going to a completely different level of chip where you're not in more or less a commodity Intel x86 line. You're getting more into like HPC, uh, high performance computing, uh, very specifically designed chips designed for doing bigger and bigger things, things like the Cray line. Um, so they, they've never really been able to do that. Uh, and now they have the Skylake brings together a lot of fabric interconnect things like 100 gig capability and 100 gig ethernet and all sorts of pieces that really take connectivity to another level and allow you to do bigger distributed machines. Mac pros are going to take advantage of some of those chips to take advantage of the CPUs. They're waiting on Intel. And the problem is, is that Intel more and more has gotten into a point, has gotten to a point where they are unable to deliver the chips that Apple needs when Apple needs them. Mm-hmm. Case in point, the new MacBook Pros. People are mad that they don't support 32 gigs. The next generation of Intel chips will, but Apple doesn't get them first. And so Apple has to wait for Intel to deliver these chips. And so Apple's stuck building machines to support. Like they, I'm sure they wanted to get the KB Lake chips, which are the ones after that that support 32 gig PMs. I'm sure they're waiting for it. They can't get them because Intel keeps slipping on delivery times. And they also have to build enough of a yield in order to support being able to sell all these PCs. Server chips don't need that high of a yield. So I, I have I have distinct uh, I have distinct issues with um, getting those those sorts of things with Apple. And I imagine I would not be surprised if if I don't want to say Apple's coming with an ARM-based machine 
But I would not be surprised to see Apple maybe make a move towards ARM for the Mac overall and start just doing their own chips. Hmm. Look, they're capable of designing and building chips at scale for the uh, – think about it. How many iPhones – they make a million iPhones a day when the new ones come out. They're fully capable of supporting the entire Mac lineup from a chip fab standpoint, just pure quantity. Now, whether or not they can build things, build those chips up to a point where they're capable of replacing an x86 processor, maybe, maybe not. Um, and, and so those are the sorts of things. I, I really do love what the new MacBooks look like. I love what they did with the ports. I know there are a lot of people who are mad about the ports and they're going to dongle hell now. Um, <laughs> As someone who recently has a number of devices that are, that are USB-C for charge and, and whatnot, I I would I would love to have those ports primarily because the charging capability, the mm-hmm. the adapter's smaller. It's one cable. I take that same cable for everything else as as everything else starts to move over. Um, I'm looking forward to those ports as, as I start to have more and more devices that are leveraging those ports already because mm-hmm. I already carry now USB cables that have an actual attached dongle to make it mini micro or lightning on the USB cable Belkin sells them. And I've just started to replace all of my cables with those and I'm getting more and more USB C cables. And, and that's what I'm looking for. And now. it's a step it's, into it. Just like whenever it's something like went over to lightning or something like that mm-hmm. with an iPhone. So I'm, you know, my first thing, thought was I'm looking at everything that I have functionally, everything that goes into my MacBook, And I'm like, I would have to have some kind of adapter for everything that I have full stop everything like because i have thunderbolts and i have usbs all of those all the high-end video uh adapters that i bought are usb3 or thunderbolt so and i, I don't think black magic even has a, a usb c version of anything right now I mean, maybe they will eventually but i, I don't think they're going to be in a hurry to when it's thunderbolt 3 so how how often are you taking those things with you uh they're fairly portable the ones that i have uh, or, and you're taking them with you quite often. Yeah, yeah. Like we were setting up full studio switching setups with with a bunch of black magic shuttles. Like the, the white box, I think, should be in front of you over by that that, that tower. Um, um, so so no, yeah, they're fairly 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 portable as far as those things go. Or even the setup for our, our live streaming rig is, is is Thunderbolt. But that again, that's something that's in a rig; it's not movable, and you probably wouldn't update it anyway. So I don't know. It, it's it's definitely a little bit of growing pains as you have with any of these things. So. Like I wouldn't be surprised, and I guess this is you want to you want to spark a fury. USB C iPhones. Um, think about how bad people got with a dock connector to Lightning Switch, and now they got to switch from Lightning <laughs> to still this. I, I don't see them doing that, especially since they. I mean, they're still releasing the the, the keyboard, mouse, and trackpad just switched to Lightning. Are all, are all Lightning? Yeah. yeah. yeah like they're yeah. really invest. So, they're still really investing now, in Lightning. The question is, how long do they go? selling um lightning to usb a that's which, what, uh, for those those not in the know that would be the your your classic usb connector the little square guy right so, so that and i'm wondering uh, that too how how are we going to see in the next iphone the cable it comes with yeah is usb c to lightning because when you go to the apple store now and you go to the back of the store when you go to pick up a lightning cable you now have two options, the USB-A option and the USB-C option, because the well, MacBooks, to charge I think charge they'll continue the to ship with the A. I think they'll continue to ship with the A until their entire lineup is C, and even then, maybe they might switch to C. And the only reason I think they're doing that is that everybody has, every place that you go to, think about this, mm-hmm. when you go to an airport or you go to mall or you go to any place that's like, hey, check it out. We've got phone charging stations here. What do they always have? They always have the re- the power outlet that has the two USB A's on it. Mm-hmm. They're not getting rid of those. Mm-mm. It's the USB A is so ubiquitous that they can't really get rid of it. Now, could they start shipping them with USB A to C adapters in the bag? Probably. I don't think they do that though. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I remember. Um, I, I I don't know. So we we were going to LA Fitness a few years ago. And it was a couple of years into lightning being a thing. And you know how many of those, those the treadmills had the 30 treadmills pins. had 30 <laughs> pins in them, which I'm like thinking like, 
like I can't even use an Android device on this, let alone like you know an Apple. But I guess the clientele, I guess it would be mostly Apple people, I'd imagine. Uh, yeah. So I, I don't know, like like the idea of bringing an adapter. I'm still using. I'm still using the Lightning adapter for my old uh, dock in my bathroom. To I, to I music. have adapters, uh, even to keep some cables. <laughs> Just from having to replace the whole cable, and I had extra adapters laying around. Right, and I I, I use them all the time. Radio docks. Anything else? Okay, of course. There's a lot from Microsoft. I, 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 Apple was mostly about what's going on with the MacBook. I was happy about the TV announcement. Really? The TV app. Okay. What, the Apple TV. Is, where they put the TV app next to the TV shows. Is this for real? Is this really going to work? Yeah. I don't see so so and here's where I'm looking at it from. So as a TiVo customer, I have that that experience to a point when I power up my TiVo guide. It knows what I have access to. It only it shows me what I have access to. I don't have voice search. I'm not that interested in the Siri search piece. I'm more interested in one app to launch. It knows what I have access to and it shows me everything in a in in, in a common layout. I've heard people saying it, it looks very much like YouTube. Um, which I'm interested in seeing more on that. But I am interested in this because it's it's actually what I'm accustomed to from a TiVo perspective. The, the TiVo thought through their menuing system and thought through their curation extremely well. And that's I'm interested in seeing that in, in this, this TV app. The other thing I like is being able to go from iPad or phone to iPad to TV relatively seamlessly. Where I don't know how this is going to work is how does it work for multiple people, which is, I think, a problem Google Home has as well. You can only set it up with one account. So if you do family sharing or something like that, will this take into account for all that? I think there's still more to be seen, but I think this is definitely a step in the right direction from a from an, from an app perspective. Do I wish they had their own streaming service? Yes, but obviously they couldn't can't come to agreement, so I, th- I think this is getting them there. The other thing I really like is the single sign-on feature. I, going from HBO Go and signing into that and then signing into Showtime anywhere and then signing into this app, I don't have to worry about that anymore. It's a it's a single sign-on experience. I mean, I would, I'd like to see them pull certain pieces out of the other apps. Uh, I know that I have Hulu. I'm a big Hulu fan. Uh, my wife is also a big Hulu fan. And so she has her things, her series in there that she's already watching. So is there a way inside the TV app that it knows that Hulu has how to get away with murder? And when the new episode is released, it shows up in the TV app and says, hey, there's a new episode. Or inside of the um, inside Netflix, uh, it, weirdly, Netflix is not in there not yet. Uh, they they did say uh, that they are investigating the opportunity. Uh, I'm guessing Apple came to them and said, "Hey, do you want to be in on this?" And Netflix was like, "We don't need you to derive views. We're good. We're Netflix." So um, there are other services that have Netflix in it. I think Roku has one that's that's very similar that Roku or that Netflix is in. But I think Netflix views Apple as a direct competitor. Um, T- TiVo has has Netflix integration, which I which I like. They have they actually have TiVo and Amazon Prime, which I'm I'm pretty happy with. And, yeah, and, and, and that's kind of where I've. That's why I've stuck with my Roku stick because Apple does not have an Amazon Prime app. That's Amazon's fault. Get on an Amazon. Uh, the Grand Tour starts in three weeks. Let's let's go. <laughs> um, I, this is that's one of the big reasons why I, I I keep I keep looking at the new Apple TV and I keep thinking I'm going to do it. And then every time I think about it, I'm like, it doesn't have Amazon Prime. Yeah, um, yeah. I still have the stick uh, in there just 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 because. Sometimes I remember I've thought about getting the new Roku stick because mm-hmm. um, they came out with a new one that has the same processor as the big Roku three or four, uh, where it's like a dual core chip. And by doing that, um, I'm able to uh, basically it, re- it fixes the problem that I have with the Roku stick, which is that it is pretty slow. Um, but yeah, I think I think the TV service is a really great idea, and I hope that this is actually a start of something bigger, maybe even that streaming service that's been rumored around. But um, I think as long as that is the as long as the TV networks still kind of hold the chips, Apple's probably not getting anything there. Hey, pairing that with that Direct TV, that Direct TV thing is as real as they're saying. 
uh, was it 35 bucks for a hundred channels? And if it's like really like, like, oh, that's actually everything that I watch and the service actually kind of works. I don't know. That's that, that, that it's something I got an eye on. So let me tell you a quick story about the direct TV thing. Mm-hmm. Uh, I was back in, I was back home in Erie, uh, seeing my mom and, uh, her husband saw this news story about, at t buying direct tv and or they have direct tv and they're buying time warner and he started talking about time warner and how they have this new service this is you know the streaming service coming or whatever and he's like so how does that work i was like well it's a service it's on the internet and then you connect to it with like your apple tv or a roku or google chromecast or something like that he goes yes but how does it get to my house and i was like the internet and he's and he he was like no 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 how are they bringing a cable to my house? And I was like, no, no, no. You'd still regularly use your regular internet. They're not doing that. There's also another service called Sling. It's very similar. And he's like, yeah, but how is at t how is Time Warner letting them use that, their wire for the service? They already have oh, TV wow. service. And I'm, I'm like, because it's the internet and net neutrality <laughs> rules prevent them from doing those sorts of things. <laughs> um, thanks, FCC. You did it. Good job. Kept, uh, kept freedom alive. But those sorts of things, it was like a like a, this was like a five minute conversation I had with him. Like he was like, "But how are they? How are they not just blocking that and say you can't use it? You have to pay for our service." And I was like, "Because they they can't like legally they can't." Mm-hmm. So uh, yeah, I I love the, those two concepts. I've considered doing it because um, uh, the one of the things I miss is live sports. Mm-hmm. Um, and so thanks to uh, a shared password, I can open ESPN on the weekends, but I've considered because I really only like watching college football. So college football starts at the very end of August and goes to the very beginning of January. So with these sorts of services, I could sign up, watch all the games that I want to. And then at the end of January, shut it off and then go from the, go from most of January, you know, February, March, this was like eight months, I think in between the end and start of each season. So I could, in theory, basically only pay for the service for four months at like 20 or 30 bucks a month. I pay for like the 120 bucks. I get all the games and I'm done. And I don't have to pay for TV service for something I'm not watching for the rest of that time. It's say a lot easier than I need to install a service or install a dish or something like that. My only concern is because like, I, I don't know the talk. I think, and I think the talk is, is a little ahead of itself. But the talk of, oh, this will replace the Dish, I hope not, because there's a lot of people that still depend on DirecTV and Dish having a satellite dish so they can get cable. And in some cases, like my father, internet. You know, yes. so we, so we dis- we've had this discussion before. Oh yeah, where absolutely. Your dad has so the slowest internet on Earth because it comes via via satellites being bounced off Siberia. Still better than the the end of the line DSL that he had, but uh, but still, and and kind of sort of has internet via his iPhone four that he has still. Um, yeah. So I don't know. I, I don't. I don't see them which, getting rid which, of the dish service as it, from a, no, no, from no, a no, satellite no. perspective. I think this is this is just another way for them to acquire customers that were looking to cord cut. Right, right. This yeah. Is, this hey, is listen, they, they could get me. Mm-hmm. They could get me pretty easily. Hey, let me give you my money, <laughs> and I'm gonna watch this. I'm gonna watch this one thing for the next, you know, four months, and then I'll be out. Well, and I'm, it it's one of those things where the other the other thing is that there's been rumors of ESPN saying to heck with this nonsense. We're doing our own over the top service. Mm-hmm. Thanks. You want to shut the game down? ESPN getting their own ESPN giving their own service basically destroys the last of the cord cutter arguments. Right. Uh, it, SB it, Nation it could did be a, that uh, point. Steve got Stephen Godfrey from SB Nation did a big piece on it was at the very beginning of the college football season. It was how do I watch college football after cutting the cord? And he went through all of the services and they were ve- it was heavily reliant on either PS View or uh, Sling. If ESPN went over the top, you would get those. This goes along with this because I'm always uh, forever fascinated with the WWE Network, and I'm kind of waiting for the point where they just say screw it. And those last couple of shows, like SmackDown, is coming out now on USA as at this moment. Uh, uh, you know, wh- where's the point where they say we don't need those on USA Network, right? Uh, and they move those over or simulcast them at least or something like that. They are sitting on their pay per view last night, which is what they really kind of advertised this nine ninety nine service on last night. But they still nah, have nah, nah, nah. they still have full fledged pay per views on cable and satellite services, whatever whichever ones still carry them. 
which I don't think are a lot of them these days, but they're still selling that same show for like $60 for the HD feed that I paid $9.99 to get that show plus everything else they offer on the network, right? Um, and that's like original content, uh, uh, all that back catalog stuff, uh, and, and a live stream of stuff that they play every day that I can just turn on my TV and see what wrestling program is on. Uh, sometimes it's reality shows, to be honest, uh, like anything else. At least it's, I'm waiting for them to get like the wrestling version of Cost, to be honest. Uh, but, um, but, but still... I happen, to, I happen to remember when we were talking about the WWE Network a while ago, um, we talked about WWE Network needing to get to a certain number of subscribers to be break-even, right? Right. What was that number, Sword? I believe it was like a million five. There are 1.46 million paid subscribers on 4, average 6, right million. And that was as of like that the was as of a week ago. Million, million and a half was the fuzzy number depending on where you read. But yeah, so they're they're good there. And plus now there's more and more ads coming on that service as well. There are pre-roll ads now. Plus the ads yeah. that run on the pay-per-views. But they're sitting there on the pay-per-view. On the pay-per-view that I paid $9.99 or maybe I got my first month free or maybe I got or maybe I paid $60 because all I have is a satellite dish. And they were like actively making fun of the people that paid sixty dollars to see that show. What's wrong well, with you? Well, <laughs> you know, I, I'm actually looking at their at, the, at their how the way, how they actually spread this out because I'm trying to figure out how they get uh, network and pay per views bundled together so you can't see the actual real numbers, which is how much they actually made from pay per view and how much they made from the network. Right, right. It doesn't matter. Um, it's it, it's just another thing. It's like Netflix. This is a thing we do. To make sure people are still dropping nine ninety nine, right? Orange is the New Black is something we produce to make sure people still drop seven ninety nine, nine ninety nine, right? Well, uh, actually, I can I can tell you the actual numbers here. There's a reason they made fun of them. WWE Network subscription revenue uh, was forty two point eight million last quarter. Total, this is network and pay per view was forty five. So they basically uh, two point three million is how much they made in pay per view money over one quarter versus the forty two they derived from the WWE Network. Wow, so already they're just lambasting their other revenue streams. So they could just get rid of those other things. In the they could. They. I, I don't think they really want to take that three that three million dollar or that two point three million dollar hit. Hey, but if you got yeah, three million totally on the could. table, you're going to take when, the three million on the table, you're, right? Yeah, and that and you're 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 completely abandoning anyone who doesn't have hey, access to high speed internet. You mean like they abandoned me with cable back in the early 90s and I stopped watching wrestling for several years cuz all I I didn't have wrestling like I, I couldn't get pay-per-views. I couldn't watch Monday Night Raw. I had the the crappy program on Sunday morning and that was it. So I gave up. Yeah, I mean no, it's, like, it's the same thing happening again. It's it's they're just like when they jumped the cable it, but now they're jumping to the next technology, and people are always going to be left behind. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, I think their fan base, um, a lot of the rural uh, people, I, I said that in a really bad way, but but uh, myself included, you know, um, you know, I think you'll leave a lot of them behind there. So oh. I'll be I'll be interested to see too how AT and T. I mean, they were already done it with some direct TV subscribers and mm -hmm. different data plans. Are you going to see? Oh, get. Get the direct TV online for fifteen dollars in addition on your plan when you sign a sign up, or get it for, or get unlimited data when you they sign give up me for something the like un unlimited data and like like twenty or thirty bucks a month for direct TV. Like the big thing that kills me. Oh, uh, uh, thirty five bucks. Actually, is that's not what they're offering. Is thirty five bucks to get direct TV right now for AT and T customers and get unlimited service. Mm -hmm. So it's not much different, to be honest. I just don't want to. I know I'm going to have to pay for the hardware one way or another. But if you're saying you're, it's seriously just 35 bucks, and then that means I can drop Hulu and maybe a couple other you know things to kind of make break even on that, that's a good and I get unlimited data. It's a freaking good deal, you know. That mm -hmm. unlimited data has an actual limit. What's that? It's, it's, it, that unlimited data has a limit of 22 gigs. What, so okay, well, which is what happens when you hit the 22? Is it throttled? Yeah, it throttles you to okay. death. Eh, we're doing sometimes about twenty five a month, but uh, <laughs> but oh, by the way, uh, in case you're wondering, Sork, I'm just now digging through the WWE report uh, that they just put out last week. They make more from the network than they do from live events. Holy crap! Because I was going to say because in that in that Netflix um, anthology or that, that Netflix uh, uh, example I was giving, Netflix doesn't also 
make money from people that are sitting there watching the thing like in person like a well, live the thing, they, thing i mean yeah. they are making a, they in the in nine months ended uh september 30th 2016 they made 137 million from the network and 105 million from the uh live events and they get 173 million from tv money jeez, jeez. so yeah i mean there's 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 a lot of money there this is not a small company right this is a 500 no, million dollar company and, and the gamble paid months. off and the gamble paid off, you know. So I yeah. think I think you I think your ESPN, your Fox Sports, for them starting to go over the top. I think they're salivating at that. I I, I I think it might be a little bit of of well, we got easy money with the access with cable, but man, I can't think there's not an executive there at least at least fishing for what would happen if we did a WWE network. Well, I I think the problem though is that you get. And this is not this is what this is what makes it really problematic for consumers is that the bundles, the TV bundles have given you so much content and so many channels over the years for like 40 bucks or 60 bucks, right? That if you go to a model where ESPN alone is charging you 10 bucks a month, there's a lot of people who are gonna be like 10 bucks a month, they get all the ESPN channels. This is great. I'm gonna go do that. All right, cool. Now I want Fox Sports. Fox Sports is going to charge you ten bucks a month. Well, I want to see NASCAR and I want to see these certain games over here because these college football conferences did it deal with Fox. So that's twenty bucks a month. I'm at twenty bucks a month just on sports and not having to try very hard. Right, but meanwhile they could be doing lower cost things because, like with WWE, more of that money goes in WWE's pocket than to the cable companies. Now they're not sharing it. That's why that's so expensive. Um, so so maybe maybe that deal you know kind of works out i don't know yeah there's definitely a shift and it's a shift in thinking i think as it is cord cutters uh we have seen that shift in thinking ourselves well guys it's been fantastic aj thank you so much for joining us and oh thank you for help, having me back as always helping me break apart my uh cord cutting strategy once again well, I, 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 I did it, and most of that is because I don't watch TV very often, so I don't have like a distinct need. But yeah, also, there's a lot of things that are still very reliant on cable subscribers. I don't think, uh, none of us here are, are cable subscribers in a traditional no. sense, I don't believe. No. So, uh, uh, I, I thought about it going I thought about going back to it, so I'm moving, and I think I'm going to switch to Fios. And as part of that, I might get their custom TV deal, hmm. but use it only to sign into things. Yeah, it's the thing. I know people will sign up for DirecTV. And never set up the box or the dish, and just use it to sign it. Because Direct TV uh, cable is- box, I got the cable box out once, so I got a, I got a, a, an actual like you know box to hook up to my TV. I got it out once because I was sick of the signal that I get in my basement for uh, like over the air stuff, and I was like, okay, I know I can get at least the over the air stuff, so I can watch like CBS, ABC on right. this box. It was it was standard def, and I didn't have the cable. Oh. <laughs> And I was like, "This is this is pure savagery. I'm out. Go away." That you, yeah. That's why we reverse ran all of the the coax around the house, and the, everything links up to a, an, an antenna in the attic. So yeah, I wasn't going that far. That, that's that's it's, it's all um, it's it's real easy. You you switch two plugs where the cable comes in and put an antenna upstairs. Should probably do that. <laughs> All right. Well, on that note, AJ, virtualpotholes.com. At AJ Cuff, at AJ Cuftick on the Twitter. Tweet me. Tell me what I got wrong. What do you talk a lot? What do you talk about on your blog? Uh, I talk about internet stuff or cloud stuff that I build and a lot of VMware stuff. Um, occasionally I will drop thoughts. Uh, I actually had the thought that I just uh, uh, enunciated there about uh, multiple subscribers charging you like 10 bucks a month that all seems fine in like one or two increments. And then you've just overrun your cable bill. I posted about that last year, (laughs) I think, or even longer ago, uh, whenever Apple was first rumored to have the, um, the, the, the cables or the, the channel service was like 25 channels. And I posted about it a long time ago and nothing has changed. So, um, let's see how long ago that was. Maybe. All right, yeah, go check it out. Go check it. And of course, chillatech.net. He tells about he talks about techie things. I got I got to get a post up because I got the the snap Android Android uh, stylus. It's awesome. Mm. In fact, the 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 point on it's really nice. So uh, I'm I'm pretty impressed with that device. Uh, I posted it exactly one year ago. <laughs> or uh, posted one year ago. It was just before June because it was just before WWDC. I have this, so, I have this wonderful thing like happening. So I pay for Google Music for Google Music. 
but then I remember I have YouTube Red. Then I feel guilty that I have not watched a single YouTube Red exclusive thing. Like I have this like like I should be using that. I pay for it, but it's not the thing that I'm paying for it for. You know. I, this is why I refuse to cancel my Google Music service. Not because I watch YouTube Red exclusive things, uh, but because when my son wants to watch YouTube, there's no ads. Yeah, that's, that's the other thing worth too. Every penny. That's the thing I keep forgetting. I'm not getting. <laughs> and nice thing is, so we have multiple accounts. We're like, you know, this this Can show. Can family share show. that? Uh, well, if you have multiple YouTube accounts, like I'll forget to log out of Wrestling Mayhem show. Still no ads. It rolls it over. Nice. Okay. So if really, you have a YouTube account. That you have. I know Abby. What's that? At, at, on Abby's phone, when she logs into YouTube, mm-hmm. she gets ads and stuff. But there's you, no family share. But, but uh, maybe it's a thing like where. So my primary login is my account for those. So, so that's one of the things that Google just started at about that same time. Yeah, was yeah. Apple always had the family share where if you bought an app, anyone on the family could buy the app and, and right. or got the app for free. And I think there's a family share on Google Music. Google, for Google brought it. Google brought yeah. it at the same time. Yeah. Because they weren't even doing app, sh- app sharing and stuff back then. Right. So I, I know it's new to that service. So you may have to configure your accounts to be kind of family members. And then my stuff's over at Sorgatron.com. That's my bloggy space. Um, and uh, we just talked about that 360 video with Scarehouse. Yes. That did. Last I checked, it was like over 50,000 hits on YouTube and at least 2,000 on Facebook. So uh, I'd say it did pretty okay. Uh, so really good to see that. Check it out. Scarehouse.com, um, their Facebook and their their uh, YouTube. And of course, Sorgatron.com. I have links to both of those directly uh, in that last one. I don't know what we're write about this week. I don't know what we got into. But you'll end up writing about Hooper, I guess. <laughs> so <laughs> meeting some great people. Great people. Um, writer from their Washington Post. And uh, the big question is, uh, why doesn't she get Amazon Prime? Why doesn't she, or why? Why doesn't she? she get Amazon Prime? Bezos owns it. Oh, uh, she, wait! She doesn't. Wait! She doesn't get it as part of being an employee, or nope, nope. like she just doesn't have employee, it, or she doesn't understand. Employee it. perks. Where's their Amazon Prime? Come on, Washington Post. So, Amazon. Listen, Amazon's got, uh, Amazon's cut rate with those. <laughs> yeah, they <laughs> with are. Their profit margins. They can't just be giving away Amazon Prime as a perk. Come on, man. That costs like $100 a year. They got like 15,000 employees. That's $150,000 a year. Also, my travels, I found the Amazon Fulfillment Center. <laughs> Congratulations. Welcome to Fairywood. There it goes. There it goes. <laughs> Same building as my clock. So, ah, there you go. All right. That's enough of that. Thank you, everybody. Check out AwesomeCast.net. Subscribe to everything. Thank you to our awesome co host. You've been our awesome audience. Have an awesome week. This show is a member of the Sorgatron Media Podcast Network. Find out more at sorgatronmedia.com.